Okay guys, welcome back. Questions one through eight are in part one of the practice question video. Um, now we'll continue on with the next questions in part two. All of the following are true of the stratum granulosum, except, all right, so let's get our bearings. The stratum granulosum, we're talking about the epidermis, right? So the epidermis is the top layer of the skin and it has four or five layers, right? The bottom is the stratum basal, then the stratum spinosum, then the stratum granulosum, the stratum lucidum, and then the stratum corneum. This is asking about the stratum granulosum. Remember that that's the layer where the cells really, really start to change. Um, they're not gonna divide anymore. They start to make peritohyaline, um, and a bunch of keratin, the cells dry out, they die. Um, so this is where we really start to see a difference in the cells, in the stratum granulosum. So let's look at our choices. All of the following are true except, so we wanna find something that's not true. Keratinocytes in this layer contain keratohyaline granules. That is true. That's why we call it granulosum. Um, it's the layer where the cells have a lot of granules. Keratinocytes in this layer produce large amounts of melanin granules? No. Uh, first off, keratinocytes don't make melanin. What kind of cells make melanin? Melanocytes. Okay, so that's not true. Also, remember that melanocytes are located down in the stratum base cell, right? So the, the body, um, of the melanocyte is down deeper in the stratum basal. It's not located in um, the stratum granulosa. So that's not true. Let's see if anything else is not true. In this layer, keratinocytes lose their nucleus and organelles. That is also true, right? Remember I said that the cells dehydrate and die. Part of that is losing their nucleus and organelles. Cells in this layer do not divide. That is also true. Cells divide in the stratum basal and they continue to divide up in the stratum spinosum. Once they get to the granulosum, they are no longer dividing, right? They're dying, essentially. Um, <clears throat> so cells do not divide, that's true. So the answer here, um, the one that's not true, is that um, keratinocytes in this layer make large amounts of melanin. Water loss due to evaporation through the skin is blank perspiration. So perspiration is just losing water through the skin. Okay, like when you perspire, perspire, you sweat, or you use an antiperspirant to decrease the amount you sweat. So perspiration is just losing water through the skin. We actually have two types. We have sensible perspiration and insensible. Sensible perspiration is the normal sweat. You sense it. You sweat, it cools the body off. That's the point. Insensible perspiration is weird. Most of us have never heard of insensible perspiration and you don't notice it. Insensible perspiration is the water that we lose by evaporation. Again, we have a bunch of keratin in our skin and it decreases the amount of water that can cross our skin because we said it's water resistant but it's not 100% waterproof. So some water does actually evaporate out of our body. That is insensible perspiration. You don't sense it, you don't notice it, but it happens. So water loss due to evaporation is B, insensible perspiration, right? Sensible would be if I said that we lose water um, via our sweat glands, right? Or we're losing water in order to cool the body. That would be sensible. Latent perspiration, I just made up. Active perspiration, I just made up. And inactive, I also made up. Okay, so the only choices would have been sensible and insensible. Why is the epidermis a good physical barrier? So this is gonna require you to kind of put together some of the concepts that we talked about. The epidermis is a great barrier. That's one of the major functions of the skin is to act as a barrier to keep our insides in and to keep the stuff that's outside the body out. 
and there are a lot of things um, or multiple different features of the skin that make it such a good barrier. Because of the dense extracellular matrix, no, um, there is not extracellular matrix. This is epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue has cell, 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 all jam-packed together. There's not a lot of stuff outside the cells. That's like connective tissue, right? Connective tissue has an extracellular matrix. Um, there should not be an extracellular matrix present. So no, A is not true. Because the cells are cross-linked with elastic fibers, no, that actually wouldn't make the skin a good barrier. Um, the cells are cross-linked with each other, but the, the keratin fibers cross-link. And we see that they're connected with desmosomes too. But both of those things, um, the keratin fibers cross-link and keratin is really strong. It's kind of a stiff protein. If the cells were linked with elastic fibers, they could separate, right? You could just push through and the cells would pop apart and then snap back and it wouldn't be a very good barrier. So that's not true, it's keratin that they're crossing. Neighboring cells are linked by desmosomes in many areas. Yes. Remember I told you guys to think of desmosomes and hemidesmosomes as staples, right? They're little proteins that connect cells to each other or to something else. So in this case, in the skin, we can have a cell here and a cell here, and there are desmosomes that grab them and hold them tightly together. So that's one of the reasons that skin is such a great barrier. Um, a and C, no, all of the above, no, so just C. The blank in keratinocytes protects the epidermis and dermis from the harmful effects of sunlight. So first off, why is the sun damaging? Okay, remember that the sun has UV radiation and that radiation um, can cause DNA mutations and cause cancers, right? That's why we use sunscreen and stay out of the sun to try and prevent skin cancers. So sunlight is damaging because of the radiation. We have a um, pigment present in our skin that protects from UV radiation. And remember we said that pigment was melanin and it's produced by melanocytes. Okay. So the melanin in keratinocytes protects from the harmful effects of sunlight or we could say protects from UV radiation. Right? Melanocytes make melanin and then they release it and it spreads throughout the keratinocytes and protects from the radiation from the sun. Okay, so the answer is melanin. Sebum is an oil. Right, that, that provides lubrication um, and protection to our skin and hair. Hemoglobin is in the bloodstream. That's got nothing to do with what we're talking about now. It's in red blood cells. Um, Carotene, remember, is an orangish yellow pigment that's in some foods, specifically carrots, hence the name carotene. Um, carotene is important because it gives vitamin A, but it can also affect the pigment of the skin. So it can make your skin yellow or orange if you eat too much of it, um, but that's got nothing to do with UV radiation. Okay, so melanin is the answer. Cyanosis signifies that a patient, so before you look at the answers, stop and think about what is cyanosis, right? So we know that cyanosis is a blue tint to the skin so when the skin starts to appear blue, we know that we first see it in areas where the skin is thin and there's a lot of blood at the surface. So we see it at the lips and around the lips. Um, we first see it in the nail beds. So where the nail bed is pink because of the, the nice oxygenated blood flow, it will actually turn blue when there's cyanosis present. So cyanosis is a blue tint to the skin. We also know that this happens when a person can't oxygenate their blood. So when they're unable to breathe and get oxygen from the environment, um, the blood appears a really darker shade and it looks blue. So cyanosis is a blue tint when the person can't oxygenate. We talked about some examples of when this would happen, right? How about an allergic reaction? Um, drowning, you pull someone out of a pool and they haven't been able to breathe they are, they are cyanotic. Um, choking, right? 
afraid if somebody's choking, they can be cyanotic. In some severe um, asthma attacks, cyanosis. In severe COPD, um, in older patients, or emphysema, they can have kind of a, a constant cyanotic state or a little bit of cyanosis all the time. Um, but really in young kids, choking, drowning is a big one, um, and anaphylactic reactions, um, allergic reactions, you can see it. So cyanosis, sorry, cyanosis signifies that a patient has had too much sun, no, lots of sunburn, right? You would see red skin, um, painful, inflamed skin. That a patient has been kept out of the sun, no, that's got nothing to do with cyanosis. That a patient has depleted melanin, um, no, if a person did not have enough melanin, they would be more likely to get a sunburn, um, more likely to get skin cancer, but that's got nothing to do with cyanosis. Um, that the patient has oxygen-starved blood or reduced blood flow, that would make sense. Okay, oxygen-starved, meaning they don't have enough oxygen in their blood. Um, has been exposed to cyanide, no. Um, that's kind of a trick one, right? Like a red herring because cyanosis and cyanide. But no, the answer, the answer is that they've got oxygen-starved blood. Okay, 14. Epidermal cells, so cells in the epidermis, produce blank, which gets converted to blank. So we talked about a specific vitamin that gets produced in the epidermis. Um, and we said that was vitamin D3. Okay, so when we're exposed to sunlight, just a little bit of sunlight is necessary. But in the presence of sunlight, our epidermal cells make vitamin D3. And we said that that gets converted to an important hormone that allows us to absorb calcium. So vitamin D and calcium are related to each other. You need vitamin D in order to get enough calcium from your GI tract. That hormone is called calcitriol. Okay, so cells produce, wait a minute, egg, no, um, vitamin D3, okay, so that's right. I know it must be either B or E. So they produce vitamin D3, which gets converted to calcitriol, right, not collagen. So the answer is B, vitamin D3 gets converted to calcitriol. I remember that because tri means three, right? Like a tricycle has three wheels. So calcitriol comes from B3. Rickets. So rickets is a condition associated with, um, students certainly can uh, get mixed up or confuse rickets and scurry, okay? Rickets has to do with a depleted or not enough vitamin D3, and scurvy is not enough calcium, okay? So don't get those two confused. Um, so rickets is, con is a condition associated with too much sun? No, again, that could be um, a skin cancer or a sunburn, but not this. Dense bones leading to removable joints? No, it's actually the opposite. Um, in rickets, the bones are weak. Okay, so they're, they're not strong. They don't hold up to the weight of the body anymore and they can start to bow and bend, especially the bones of the legs. Vitamin D3 deficiency leading to weak bowed bones, that's it. Remember I said we need vitamin D3 in order to absorb calcium. So if we have a deficiency in D3, we can't absorb enough calcium and it's calcium that makes the bones strong. Okay, so with rickets, we see a bowing of the bones and weak bones, but it's because we don't have enough vitamin D3. Uh, calcium C deficiency leading to weak bones, that is scurvy. Okay, so they both end up with weak bones and they're both deficiencies in vitamins. It's just either vitamin D with rickets or vitamin C with scurvy. Okay, number 16. The dermis contains the outer blank layer and the inner blank layer. So the dermis has two layers, 
I remember the outermost layer is the papillary layer, and then the deeper layer is the reticular layer. They're both made out of connective tissue. Okay? They're no longer opening or lining an open surface, so they're not epithelial tissue. Um, both layers of the dermis are connective tissue. Remember, the pop is areolar connective tissue with collagen and elastic fibers. And then the deep, thick part of the dermis, the reticular layer, um, is dense, irregular connective tissue. Remember, that was the one with collagen. It's all swirled, going in all different directions. And that provides the strength um, because our skin can be stressed from all different directions. Okay? But papillary layer and reticular layer. So papillary and the inner one is reticular. That's good. This is backwards. Um, hypodermis and epidermis, those aren't even in the dermis, so that's completely wrong. Um, and then stratum corneum and basal, those are up in the epidermis. Okay? They're still talking about the top and bottom layers, but these are not layers that are in the dermis, they're epidermal layers. 17, which of the following is true of the dermis? Um, the dermis displays a high degree of cellularity compared to the epidermis. No, it's the opposite. Cellularity is like how many cells you have. The epidermis has way more cells packed in because it's epithelial tissue. The dermis is vascular. Yes, the dermis has blood vessels. The epidermis does not. Um, so B is true. The dermal papilla extend towards the hypodermis. No. The dermal papilla are the little fingers at the top of the dermis that reach up towards the epidermis. They're not at the bottom reaching down, so no. Um, a and C, no, all the above, no. So just B, the dermis is vascular. 18. During a standard sensory test, so we're testing a patient's senses, right? What they can feel. A patient is unable to sense deep pressure and vibration. Which of their sensory receptors is likely impaired? So remember, we've got a couple different types of corpuscles, um, sensory receptors that are present down in the dermis. We have tactile corpuscles or Meister's corpuscles. Those are at the top of the dermis and those provide information on light pressure. Down deeper in the dermis of our light touch, down deeper in the dermis, we have proscenium corpuscles or lamellated corpuscles, lamellar corpuscles. Those give us information on deeper pressure and vibration. So if a patient can't sense that deeper pressure, then they probably have an issue with their lamellated corpuscles. Uh, Merkel cells are really sensitive cells up in the epidermis. And dendritic cells, remember, are immune system cells. Dendritic cells are also up in the epidermis, and those are the, the Pac-Man, the immune system cells that roam around and engulf anything that um, gets past, like the stratum corneum, anything that gets down into the lower layers of the epidermis, the dendritic cells will engulf and destroy. The subcutaneous layer refers to what? Remember subcutaneous is another name for the hypodermis, right? The layer underneath the skin. That's what we call it subcutaneous. Cutaneous is the skin, right? The cutaneous membrane is the epidermis and the dermis. Sub is below. So that's just the layer that is below the skin. Subcutaneous um, or hypodermis, same thing. Okay, I'll pause there again, and then we'll do one more video after this.